This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. And we're kind of in the what I call the cradle, I guess, uh, between December 25th and January 1st, where, for the most part, not a whole lot gets done. It seems like most all the parties are finished uh, until New Year's Eve. Uh, Everybody's finished with the Christmas, I guess, Hanukkah parties or whatever kind of holiday things, so that there are very few parties that uh, people have traditionally during this time. So it's a little bit more of a quiet time, and also during this time is whenever that a lot of companies are not doing a lot of work and people have taken some vacation time or even if they're at work it does uh, kind of scale back it's just uh, not a lot of um, things get accomplished in the office around this time of the week which means you probably have more time to go back into the archives and listen to some old episodes from the magic word podcast uh, you'll have some uh, time to do that perhaps uh, well, if you're not doing anything else there at work just kind of tune into that and you'll learn a lot and this week's episode is another one that i think you're going to learn a lot from if you don't mind me Ending a sentence with a preposition there. Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, Last week we had what I thought was kind of an inspirational podcast where we talked with Michael Goddard, an artist uh, who talked about the similarities, I guess, in creativity and the overlap there is as an illustrative artist that he is versus a performing artist, what magicians do, and uh, different things uh, about how we create. And uh, anyhow, I thought it was just a fascinating conversation and inspirational. This one this week is another one that I think that you're going to enjoy and find some inspiration in then as well. Uh, This uh, is a conversation with Marty Gilbert, who is a Canadian magician, and I have known him for a little while, uh, but I really haven't had a chance to sit down with him to have a really good conversation until this year when he was at the Texas Association of Magicians Annual Convention in San Antonio, Texas. And so we got a chance to chat several times and then actually went into the room and, um, you know, I gave him a mic and I had a mic and we, we we recorded this conversation. Uh, now, those of you who do know Marty or may have seen him, he's been on Penn and Teller Fool Us, and uh, spoiler alert, he did fool them. And uh, so he uh, also uh, was born without any hands or feet. So it's uh, much like uh, Matthias or Matthew Buchinger uh, from the uh, 17th century in Germany. Uh, and we talk a little bit about uh, that as well. But uh, the main thrust of this really inspirational speech inspirationally speaking, I guess, is um, uh, uh, about finding inspiration and things that are important. In other words, uh, talking about Penn and Teller Foolish and some other television shows, you know, what do you expect to get as a result of being on television? Uh, And also some of the places that he has traveled, in particular China, and some of the successes uh, that he's had and things that he can do uh, in in overcoming some of the challenges that he's had, which I uh, we kind of get into some really uh, interesting conversations conversations here. So I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to let you hear it for yourself direct from his mouth. So please welcome my guest this week, Mr. Marty Gilbert here on A Magic Word. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. And uh, today I've got someone with me that I have uh, seen at some magic conventions and some of you as well. And I know that you have uh, heard of him. And he was one of the people who was featured at Magic Live this year. And we've uh, uh, kind of crossed paths in different places. Uh, first time actually was at Magi Fest uh, a few years ago. And I didn't get a chance. Actually, we were across the bar from each other. I didn't get a chance. You were just kind of had a crowd around you over there. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to have an opportunity to sit down then with a Canadian magician all the way down here. Now he's in uh, Texas as we're speaking here today, Mr. Matty Gilbert. Hey there, Matty. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Fantastic. So glad to have you uh, over here then. Right. Yeah, as I said, I remember, what year would that have been? That would have been... That was 2013. 13. Okay, that yep. was, yeah, a ways back. It was uh, the first Magi Fest run by uh, Joshua J. and Andy... Yes, I think that was their uh, uh, first one over there. And uh, were they friends of yours, or how did they? Uh, they uh, no, I didn't. Them? I didn't know them uh, back then. They uh, they got in touch with me. Uh, they got my number from somebody, and they're like, "Oh, hey, you know, we've been hearing about you. Do you want to come to our convention?" And that was actually the first convention that actually no no no. The, well, 
that was the second convention that I did. That was the first one that I got paid for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, that was like a, uh, a, a, a marker for me because I'm like, oh, wow, I'm getting paid to go to a convention. Yeah. So. <laughs> and when you did that, was that, uh, did, you just did uh, some close-up? Did you do a lecture? I, uh, I recall it was just close-up. No, oh, it was just, just a uh, close-up. It was sort of like a mixture of a talk slash interview and performing magic. Right. Uh, and that was really, would you say, your introduction to uh, to magicians and magic conventions? Yeah. The and first people? magic convention that I ever went to was MagicCon in 2010, the first MagicCon. And uh, the first convention that I ever spoke at was uh, in 2012 in MagicCon. But, now, that was Dan or Dave Buck, yeah, is that Dan right? Yeah, Dan and Dave Buck okay. down in San yeah. Diego. And before that, uh, before 2010, I virtually knew no magicians. I uh, a few months before that convention, I started going to my local magic shop in Toronto, Browser's Den, uh, to hang out and meet magicians. And yeah. they told me about this convention, and I I went. And I, I ever since I've been going to I've been going to a few conventions a year. And that was really Dan Dave's books is really a uh, a card convention, you know, kind of a thing, isn't? It? Would you say mainly kind of like a yeah, lot of cardations well, and everybody? I think uh, I think they were trying to do like a, a different style format where it was more mm -hmm. talks and stuff instead of lectures and, and contests and all that kind of stuff yeah. yeah right did they have dealers uh because i oh never gosh. went to the magic con it's, they had a different dynamic they had a lot of younger people i know there too. you know what i don't remember any dealers they, okay I, I i honestly can't remember mm -hmm. hmm. well you mentioned the, the browsers what's his name browser den yeah Bra browsers den of magic it's canada's oldest magic shop right now uh unfortunately all the other ones have Closed down throughout the years. Yeah, I've heard that they have an annual convention. Then also, they do. They do. Yeah. It's been running for I think four years now, and mm -hmm. uh, it's it's you know it's been growing. I remember back when they were first doing it because we usually have a anniversary party every single year, and that's yeah. around November ish. And it was just a small party where people would come to the shop and hang out, and they'd have cake and stuff. So the owner Jeff. Pinsky, he's like, oh, you know, I want to do a, you know, a, like a convention type thing, a one day thing. Mm -hmm. And at first, we they were talking about renting out the uh, the Vietnamese restaurant across the street. Okay, <laughs> and they thought like thirty people would <laughs> didn't show think people. Up. Yeah, exactly, small thing. And uh, they soon realized, no, hundreds of people are signing up, so they had to rent a real venue. And, wow. and put it on, and you know, they've been they've been doing a fairly good job. So I, I wish them continued success. It's and I've been a part of. Not all of them, because I haven't been there for all of them, but every single time I'm in town, I, I, I go and hang out. Yeah, my buddy uh, Peter McClonaghan from Scotland comes oh, over. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, year. I saw him last year. I was shocked. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because the last time I saw him was in a, a bar in, in Glasgow. <laughs> and I'm going through this, and I see this guy. So what are you doing here? <laughs> exactly. It was, it was surreal. Surreal. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, he, Peter was one who told me about that convention. And apparently, as I recall, didn't it uh, happen just before the 4F convention? Uh, it happens in April, usually. Yeah. I think it's um, around April Fool's, something like that. Oh, it's the first part of April then. Yeah, okay. I, if I'm correct. Because the 4F is always the last weekend of April. It's close, but I don't know how close it is. Okay. But I could be totally wrong on the date. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so you say it's continued to grow. I would imagine like the 4F at some point, they're going to be at a max they can't hold anymore. Well, they uh, the venue that they're at now, I think can hold a few more people, uh, but it's, it is it is packed. I mean, it, it's a huge room. Yeah. But they, they, may, they do make it a very personal and it's, it's really cool. They have cameras or anything? And, yeah, uh... they have cameras, they have projectors, uh, you know, they have all, all this tech and everything and everything takes place in this one big room. Uh huh. Uh, nobody moves around. You're given a table, and uh, on the table they give you like a bottle of wine, and you 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 hmm. you're just hanging out all day and watching yeah. things, and it's it's a really fun. They say they give you a bottle of wine. I mean, is it like? A... Well, they give me a bottle of wine. I don't know oh. if I got one. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe because I was performing. I'm not too sure. Oh, okay, I was gonna say maybe the performers get a bottle of wine. Well, they have different wine. levels. They have the VIP level, and then they have like a silver level, uh -huh. and then a bronze. And depending on what level you purchase, you're sitting closer to the stage, and you have, you know, more uh, freebies given sure. to you. Sure. Yeah, like a VIP. Yeah, I gotcha. Right. Exactly. Um, and. Um, when they do that, I mean, it's, have you been to the Pebble Palooza that uh, lands? No, Christmas I've never on? been. I want to go. You I, need to come I've been. Down. I've been on the Pebble. I think I've been kicked out of, off the Pebble a few times. What? 
uh, not no, just by accident because uh, they have rules about inactivity. Oh yeah, and I just I I I I'm usually so busy that I forget to log in, and so they keep kicking me off and then <laughs> and then taking yeah. me back. Uh, yeah, I'd be afraid to join for the same reason. I've got so many other things and activities that that is not. Uh, yeah, I'm not on there all the time, you know. Yeah. But any of the pebble, you don't have to be on the pebble to go to the Pebble Palooza. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I have never yeah. been to the Pebble Palooza okay. yet, but I would love to go. I know all those guys; they're all sure. great guys. So. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun uh, as well. And a lot of people actually probably twice as many attend and just hang out in session all night you know well, that's what i like about those smaller conventions i really like the the size of this convention mm-hmm. uh taom because it's a smaller size you can actually hang out with people yeah you know we were just at uh magic live and it's just crazy i think it's 1500 magicians 1600 people exactly yeah i i, I I would see some of my friends on the first day and then never see them again. <laughs> <laughs> Not again. Well, or, or vice versa. I saw some people the last day and said, you've been here the whole time? I well, know. it's because, you know, we have different colored badges. And so you're Even crossing paths. Even if you paths. have the same color badge, well, that's true it's too. just so big. Yeah. It's so big. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's been, it's been, you know... It's been fun, this convention. I like those smaller conventions. Well, this didn't used to be such a small convention. In fact, this used to be larger than the uh, Nationals, uh, IBM and the SAM conventions. Oh, wow. Uh, in fact, when I was president of the TAOM in the year 2000, that was the last year we actually had uh, about 1,100 people. Last time we had over 1,000 people. And so since then, it's been declining. And this year, I and as we're talking, by the way, as, as Maddie and I are talking, this is uh, over Labor Day weekend, which is the 1st of September in uh, 2019. And uh, we have a little less than 200 people. So it's really declined a lot. Again, that used to be just a lot of people who would attend. But I think conventions in general, and I say in general, are kind of declining. Those that are large, like the Magi Fest and Magic Live and Genie Con- Convention, tend to be the kind of the, the big dogs right now. That is true. Um, it, it's, it's, I think it's just so hard because – a lot of the bigger conventions have bigger budgets because of the number yeah, of true. people that they have attending. Sure. So they really make it extraordinary. And I think it makes it harder for everybody. But I think that's just a trend in magic. I mean, I remember in years ago, you used to be able to film uh, you know, a little video mm-hmm. and be able to put it out. But now everything's mm-hmm. so overproduced. Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's impossible for me to really film my own magic and release it because – my my skills at video editing and video filming are not at the industry standard right now. That's a good point. Yeah, and also that there ha- they've gone the way of just the one trick DVD, where it used to be, of course, uh, where that you would have have out a book with a lot of tricks in it, and then you would have a DVD with your whole lecture on it, you know, basically. Uh, and then now you just have like one thing for five or ten dollar download or whatever kind of a thing. Likewise with music, you know, where it used to be albums, then CDs, and then finally just have a, a one tr- uh, one song download. For my tunes yeah it's definitely changing um i'm trying to i'm trying to adapt to it uh but it, it is hard i you know I, i've done a few projects now and i'm doing um what have you been like, working on I've, I've done a a penguin live lecture a few months ago and right after this i'm going to murphy's to to film their at the table lecture yep so that'll be fun. Um, That's a good experience. I did that uh, last year, and uh, they really do a first class job. And when you pull up, they got you know VIP parking space for you, and have your name on there and everything. And and uh, George, who's the director, puts everything together, and the studio is nice. And then go out to dinner afterwards. But uh, you know, wh- however much time that it takes to put together, I mean, they were very accommodating. It's very nice. Yeah. No, it's uh, and the marketing I, too is all great, and they just do a professional job for you. It's one of the things I like about doing tv is you get such good footage mm-hmm. i think tv is one of the most misunderstood things in magic really? i always get weird comments from people because they see me on a tv show like penn and teller and mm-hmm. uh it is very good for you but it's, it's very weird how it affects you in a lot of ways um in terms of uh the perception of it versus the reality of uh going on any tv show and uh, in terms of selling stuff, marketing yourself as a magician, you know, I uh, I remember talking to actually I won't name name them, but a few few very big magicians who have been on all these TV shows, late night shows, mm-hmm. and asking them directly, like, how was it for your career? And they're like, it's great, but I I got no work from it directly. 
And the truth is, you do get uh, you do get good opportunities when you're on television, but it's not automatic in the way that you would think it is. Usually, it, I think if, for me, the way I look at TV and all that stuff is it's a credential for you. It shows that you you are uh, professional, and then when you are advertising yourself as a magician, people know that you know you are good because you you've been on this program and this program and you've done this right and uh but it it is it is weird the perception of it people think that you know you go on a you do one episode of Penn and Teller and then you're booked for the rest of the year well <laughs> i think there are a couple of misconceptions and it goes back perhaps when johnny carson used to be the late night talk show host that was the kingmaker basically if you were on the carson show then you'll be getting phone calls the next day you know even if he just dropped your name i have a friend who was in omaha and johnny carson had just mentioned his name as being a magician and he said he got three calls the next day and he was just a, a no-name guy out here and they were wanting him to do this trade show and come up and he just said who is it and they found out who he was because he mentioned he knew him from nebraska back when he's growing up in omaha anyhow that and of course if you came in then you know you were made man you know basically and likewise uh, then today, America's Got Talent is another one that once that you have been on, and particularly if you win, that you can go on. But different people who have been on whose careers have obviously been made, if you if you don't have to win the million dollars, that you'll be able then to uh, go on and go on tour, you know, for a few years. Of course. But you, what you probably don't see in the background is those guys working really hard to leverage those experiences in mm -hmm. order to get to the positions that they want to be in. Yeah. Because, I mean... In everything you, I think as a magician, you, a lot of the work that you, you're doing is you're selling yourself and you're pitching yourself uh, to clients. Right. And you're pitching projects, whether you're working, you know, with a theater or you're working uh, with a hotel or where, wherever it is that you're working with a producer, you have to, you have to be able to sell sort of the idea of what you're doing and, and get people uh, interested and show them that you're actually competent. And I think that's what TV does. Uh, that's true. Well, it's... I was going to say, similar to, let's say, graduating from college. You know, if you have a college degree, that doesn't mean you're going to be getting a job in the career that you had studied for. It just shows that you have the stick to and you have the ability and the drive and, and you have finished, you know, what you start out to do. And so you are at a different level than someone perhaps who hasn't gone. Same thing there. I think if you are going to be on television, that it gives you better credentials, you say, for your resume to say, well, I've done this and that. And it uh, sounds good, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that's the way I look at it. But it's funny. I always it, I always talk to you know go, coming to a convention like this. People are like, "Oh yeah, I saw you at Penn and Teller," mm -hmm. and they're like, "What did that do for you?" And like you're trying to explain to them <laughs> how it works, but people just think it's like a magical like thing where you just are... boing all of a sudden yeah that the magic fairy dust gets powdered on you and all of a sudden you just have a great career and you go on mm -hmm. well it's it doesn't work exactly like that so i'll give you i'll give you a real example from my okay. life so i did i did a huge tv show in china uh the big it was actually the biggest tv show uh in the world for 12 weeks mm-hmm uh, you've never heard of it because it's from China. China, yeah, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> but it's called The Amazing Magicians, and well, we do the... have Chinese listeners, actually. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, they, they probably know it. Yeah, what's it called? The Amazing Magicians. Okay. So, uh, on the episode that I was on, there was 650 million viewers. Wow, which is a lot. For yeah, people. it is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what is that? Two times the number of people that live in the U.S. Close to that. It, it's it's a lot of people. A lot, yeah. So uh, I did that show, and directly from that show, I got a few gigs. But what what was the what was really great about it is now I, I get to do a lot of work in Asia uh, because hmm. different people and stuff who have seen the show and they want to work on projects in in those countries, yeah, like uh, stage shows, things like that. Uh, commercials but that's because they've seen it you have to remember that the ordinary person it, it, i think there used to be a time where people were able to afford uh entertainment like i think people were able to you know throw parties and uh, hire bands and stuff but i think the number of people who are hiring live entertainment in general 
is mm-hmm. declining and it's being done more and more by bigger organizations or of course anybody you know who has money is doing it but i think the regular person like if i were to have a birthday party and invite some people it, it would be a very weird thing for me personally if i were to invite uh if i were to hire you know uh talent to come and perform at my party okay for me personally and i think a lot of people are in that situation so you just have to like keep an eye on different markets and uh, be able to maneuver because the world is constantly changing. I've heard even even companies when they had uh, the recession, a lot of mm-hmm. uh, the corporate magicians have told me that a lot of the companies are hiring less and less uh, performers just because when they they were in times of financial difficulty uh, and they had to cut out at that entertainment for that year just because you know that's a discretionary expense basically and yeah. so they can decide that this is frivolous well, well what's happened and their stockholders don't want them to spend that money either exactly and what people have told me is because you know they've gone a year without it they're like oh well we had our meeting last year and we didn't have any performers why don't why don't we save money again this year even though <laughs> yeah, we're doing, we got by without yeah, it before we could do it again exactly yeah. So it, it is, you have to keep an eye on things and, you know, there's always different opportunities right now. I think right now Asia is uh, really hot for magic. Um, I think magic wasn't very popular in Asia mm-hmm. for a long time, but right now it's becoming more and more popular. Yeah, I know that Mike Miller had uh, been taking people over on a tour of that, you know, and Rocco has been great. Of course, in Macau that uh, uh, Franz Ferrari had uh, his uh, thing that was going mm-hmm. on uh, that um, uh, for a few years, and that was very successful. So I know the magic is hot over in Asia. Well, and it's it's the weirdest thing, the way that it happens. One of the, uh, and you'll, you'll never believe this, uh, but one of the big drivers to magic is, in China is the movie Now You See Me. Not a lot really? of American movies get released in China uh-huh. because they just, you know, it's a totally different world and they do things I differently. I could imagine, yeah. But that was one of the movies and there's only a few movies per year that get brought over to China. They and get released. cleared by the censor board, I guess, in China. Exactly. And huh. then released into the public and promoted. And Now You See Me, that series was one of the series. Hmm. Uh, and because of that, Magic became very popular, and then yeah. because of also you know uh, some of the shows uh, that I've done and been involved with, that's also making it more and more popular. Right now, when you gone over, how was it that you were uh, identified to say, "Hey, won't you come over?" And oh talk? gosh, it was you know. So the first time <laughs> I was uh, I was in New York and I met this magician uh, from China. My friend Tony Chang introduced me to this Chinese magician, and okay. we ha- we hung out, we had drinks, and. And uh, like two years later, I get an email. Would you like to come to China and be part of the Magic Olympics? And uh, we're going to pay you uh, a ridiculous sum of money to be involved in this show. We have a budget for the program of, I don't know, was it was either like $50 million or, or wow. no, it was even higher. It was, it was a crazy oh, wow. budget. <laughs> And I, I honestly, I didn't believe it. I thought it was a scam. I was going to say it sounded like a scam, like a Nigerian prince or something kind of email. That you I thought it was a scam, <laughs> and uh, I I didn't feel comfortable because I had heard horror stories, and I had been talking to friends. I, I remember asking uh, my friend Paul Wilson about it, and he was telling me uh, about some magician's horror stories, and I got spooked. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want like to Like what? Where they have uh, Where not they, paid? or Well – where they just go into something and then it ends up being something totally different than they're used to. Okay. Then what they were promised maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just describe things and then you get there and it's a different type of show or, or they want to, uh, like one of the popular things in China is to pit you against, uh, Chinese, uh, people like Hmm. Chinese magicians because it's like, they always want to show like Chinese superiority, Chinese superiority. I understand. So, like, if they bring anybody international, it doesn't mean that you're vilified, but it just means that, like, at the end, they're going to win. Okay. <laughs> you know, okay. like, okay. no matter what's <laughs> happening, at the end, the Chinese people yeah. will win. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of drama and, you know. But uh, so, anyways, I heard all these stories and I didn't think it was real. So, I just, you know, and also the communication was bad. There was a lot of uh, difficulties in, in miscommunication in the mm-hmm. emails. 
just because the person who I was communicating with wasn't speaking English Not good. Uh, well. And so finally, like it's months and months that go by and I'm, I I forget about the show. I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Yeah. And then the guy who I met contacts me. And he's like, oh, it's a real thing. And, and then I find out from a few of my friends who are working on the show as well. Okay. It's a real thing. You know, you should go. And I went mm-hmm. and, uh, it, it was it was a lot of fun, but and so you've been back a second time. Yeah, I've been back a few times. I'm going back. Uh, I'm spending the entire month of October there. So it's. Uh, and were you the only magician then, actually, as part of the group? Or uh, no, no. There's a there's a few there's a few magicians. So that first time was with a uh, was was with a TV show, and then I've been back uh, to perform in live shows. Mm-hmm. And so the show that we're doing in October is a continuation of a show that we did last year. And um, I, th- I think we're only doing it in Shanghai uh, in October, but I, I'm i going to be doing other stuff in China as well. I think uh, motivational speaking and mm-hmm. uh, some other some other shows and just working on future projects as well. Wow. It, it, so it's mainly in China or are there other uh... – Right now, it's in China. Uh, they're talking about bringing stuff to other Asian countries, the people who I'm working with, but I, I just can't talk about it yet because sure. it's yeah. not, mm-hmm. you know. And been released. They do, they do deals behind the scenes with uh, casinos and different businesses. And you, you just, you, you, I, I, I just, I'm never clear to announce anything <laughs> until it's, uh, yeah. you know, officially announced. I understand. Uh, do you feel that you're bigger in China than you are in Canada? Yeah, you know what? So in Canada, I I don't I don't I I've done work in Canada, but I've done so much work in other places um, that I you just mean like across the U.S. and other. Yeah, I do most of my work in the U.S. and in Europe, and um, I very little of my work is in Canada, hmm. which is kind of unfortunate because. You know, I guess there's a saying: you're never a prophet in your own your own country, right? Mm-hmm. Your own nation, and uh, that's the feeling that I had. Um, I guess w- I, I I don't know. I, Canada is a weird market. Most mm. of the market in Canada, I think, is in Quebec. Um, and you're where again? In Toronto. Ben, in Toronto, sorry. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason why I say that is because that's the only place where they speak French. So they have their own programming there. So all the big magicians mm-hmm. in Canada who have done uh, TV shows in Canada have done them in Quebec. Don't they have a French police also making sure people speak French? Uh, I've heard this. No, not, it's no? it's okay. no, but it's a legal thing um, because uh, because Canada is bilingual. Uh, everything that needs to be in French and English on packages and stuff. Mm-hmm. So for even when I printed my deck of cards. I actually had to uh, tell uh, the U.S. playing card company keep my cards in the U.S. because if I they they told me if you want to ship if we're printing these cards for you if you want to ship them to Canada yeah. we we have to they won't legally let it over the border unless it's in English really? and French yeah unless it's in both the yeah, languages yeah because you're not allowed to sell products of anywhere in canada or just in toronto anywhere in canada i think unless it's i mean it's it's like one of those rules if you do it i don't think anything will happen but if they catch you mm-hmm. at the border you can get in in some sort of trouble yeah so you just avoid that altogether. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like all the big companies yeah. you know if you buy a, a dvd or you know coca-cola anything uh, mm-hmm. Any product, McDonald's, it's always in English and French. They yeah. they just have to do it that way. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that you got the career that you do, and and being a speaker, then also you're what twenty nine. Yeah, twenty nine. Twenty nine. Okay. Uh, you got any plans for your thirtieth birthday? Uh, I'll be in China, so um, I don't know. I think I'm working on my birthday, but it's fine. <laughs> you know what? I'd rather be in China with my with my friends working on a show. Sure. Because I have spent birthdays on the road in between gigs where I'm in a town that I don't know anyone and mm-hmm. I'm just at a hotel and I have nothing to do. <laughs> All alone. Yeah, then it gets to be kind of sad. <laughs> and I go, to the lob- I go to the hotel restaurant, order myself a slice of cake and just uh, glare off. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a weird life as a performer. I've, I've spent Christmases away from home, um, spent birthdays mm-hmm. uh, alone as well. You know, you you just never know where you always are going where there's work. Right. You right. Know? 
and it's always in different places. Now, on your journey, then also, since you were born with without hands and feet, you were saying, uh, and then uh, developed actually the skills to be a magician, uh, that you don't have hands, but you've got then essentially what? Then it's like a fingers or muscles? Or I mean, how can you pick up the uh, cards? What do you do? With- uh, I mean, I have, I have uh, parts of my arm, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I... I, I I mean, I, I just, I, I feel like I've always had a lot of dexterity mm-hmm. and I think I've developed this dexterity through a few ways. I think one of the ways though, primarily was through computers and through video games. Really? Okay. When I was younger, I would play a lot of Super Nintendo and all that stuff. Yeah. And um, I'm actually going to, it looks like, it's not confirmed yet, but it looks like I'm going to be working with a a technology company soon because they're they have this whole project on how to make things uh adaptive for uh children who have disabilities and want to be able to connect with their friends mm-hmm. and do activities through the uh through the power of technology to in order to experience you know fun with their friends in ways that they can't do it like a kid may be in a wheelchair he may not be able to play soccer with the other kids right uh, in the same way, but maybe he can play soccer on, you know, a computer and he has, sure. you know, and he can, he can, they can, uh, they can access the world that way. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I'm just talking with a, it's a, I, I can't say anything now because it's not ready. Another one of those things that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, one of those weird things where it's like, I wish I could talk about it, but if it ends up happening, it will be really cool and very inspiring to me because I feel like technology has helped me so much uh, in developing what I do. I don't think I would have had dexterity otherwise. And uh, now I, I think I have uh, fairly good dexterity. I think I type something like 50 words a minute. Holy moly. And uh, I've just been used to it since I was a kid, just sure. typing. In a regular keyboard? Yeah, regular That's keyboard. And... You know, I'm thinking back to uh, Matthias Buchinger, I guess, oh, yeah. that uh, you <laughs> hear probably all the time. <laughs> People ask you about that. And for those who are listening who don't know, uh, he was a 16th century, or sorry, 17th century magician back in the 1600s, uh, who was also born without uh, feet and arms, uh, but it was able to be a master, I guess, the cups and balls, what I understand. Yeah, yeah. so he was born in 1674. Mm-hmm. in Ansbach, which is a small town right outside of Nuremberg. Actually, he, technically, he was born in uh, in another small town, even smaller than Ansbach. But it, I don't even know the name of it. It's so small that it doesn't even have a name right now. Wow, okay. That's how small it was even yeah. back then. Uh, but he he was born without any hands and feet, and he he had to develop these skills in order to make a living for himself because he couldn't have a regular life. I think in that time, if you were born uh, without any uh, hands or feet or you, Mm -hmm. you had any disability or disfigurement in some ways, you didn't really have a lot of options in life. And I think for him, his only options were to either become extraordinary at something or to d- uh, display his body and mm-hmm. to to beg, they be had, a beggar in the street. Yeah. They had, uh, I, I guess you would call them freak shows, where people would just display themselves if they were were disfigured, and people would pay to see because mm. it was like a curiosity. Like, let's go see, you know, whatever whatever yeah. is behind this curtain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, but instead of doing that, and he didn't want to beg either, he he just became incredible at many things he he and he also he also did ordinary tasks in his show as well so for example uh, in his morning shows he would open the show by shaving he would do his daily shaving mm-hmm. and then with that uh with with the blade that he would shave with he would cut a piece of quill a bamboo quill uh, a, a piece of bamboo he would carve it into a quill oh okay and then with that quill he would uh, he would start drawing with it and doing mm. calligraphy, drawing people in the audience, and then from there he would do uh he would do things with cards. Mm-hmm. Apparently he was uh, an expert at gambling. Nobody could beat him at cards. He would do magic with coins. He performed the cups and balls. At the end of that trick, he would produce live birds under the cups, mm-hmm. which I think was. Very, I think it's even rare today. I, I I've never seen anybody do it live, but 
I think uh, producing chickens mean like uh, well, I know no, he's little in... little uh, no little birds. There would be little birds and oh, okay. produce them under the cups because you know Johnny Ace Palmer's the only one I can think of it as chicks. See, so, yeah, it would mm-hmm. it would. I don't know if they were chicks, but th- I think they were similar. I, okay. I'm not too sure which bird they were. Um, he would do. He he played instruments. He would play about twelve different instruments in a show. Uh, mm-hmm. Many of them of his own invention. For example, to play like a flute like. Uh, instrument he had this box that he he carved out and it had a hole in it and holes in the top and side so he'd put that you know instrument in he'd be able to blow and then cover the holes with his arms and be able to you oh. know, make music okay uh he he was an expert marksman he would do uh marksman uh he would do trick shots in a show uh-huh and he would end the show with a very curious thing. He did, He rotated his material, but he would always uh, apparently end the show. And this was the highlight of his show with the demonstration of bowling with Skittles. Uh, he, he People would be able to set up the pins. And then on either side of the pin, they would have a lit candle. Okay. And he'd be able to roll the ball uh-huh. so that the ball could hit the pins without knocking out any of the candles. Wow. And curve and hit multiple pins. And that's how he would end the show. That's a good finale. Yeah. <laughs> so it was cool. like it was a it was a mixture of magic and dexterity and, you know, normal life skills and right. you know, just to show that uh how extraordinary he was. And um I think he was just amazing at everything he did. Well, it sounds like you did a lot of research on him. Did you start researching him uh, after you got into magic or beforehand? No, was he there... was so – oh, gosh, this is a funny story. So I uh, one of the first books uh, on magic I ever read was David Blaine's book. I was a big fan of David Blaine, and I bought yeah. his book. And I remember reading it, and he, he they talk about all the magicians in history and stuff. And you're learning about Max Molini and all these guys, and it was just really exciting. And then I thought, like, oh, wow, out of all the magicians in the world, I'm going to be the first magician without any hands. And I went to bed with, with that thought, and stopping on a page, I had a bookmark in. And then in the morning, I opened the book, and I start reading again, and I turn the page, and there he is. There he is. And I, I remember I was so angry. I was like, <laughs> you were upset. What? How, how dare he come? <laughs> how dare he come before me? You know, I thought, I thought I was special. <laughs> but, uh, ever since then, I've been learning a lot about him and, uh, he, he was just an amazing guy. I, I want to recreate a lot of his stuff. I've been working on a few projects trying to recreate his material and uh, the skills that he did. It's so difficult, but I think it'll be so cool when it's ready. Part of that is uh, in the show that I'm working on in China, I don't only do magic in that show. I also play the piano and we're working on uh, adding other instruments as well. Wow. So, so how long is the show? An hour and a half? Uh, that, well, that's, it's not a show that's only me. It's a show with multiple performers. Oh, variety, okay. And, uh, they're not all magicians, but I'm one of the magicians, uh, on it. And, uh, I don't know how long I'm doing, uh, on this current one, but. About 12 you, or 15 minutes or something. Yeah. You get a, you get like a highlight of the mm-hmm. best of what I do. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's really cool. So I play the piano in the show. Have you and, played the piano all your life? No, I You're learned from the show. Oh, really? Well, it was one of my dreams to to play the piano when I was a kid uh-huh. growing up. I had a teacher who told me, you know, Matty, you can do whatever you want in life except for play the piano. Okay. <laughs> and ever since then, I thought, you know, screw this. <laughs> I hate people tell me I'm going to no. yeah. play the piano. And uh, I, it was a dream that I, I didn't pursue for – but I told one of my friends who was a composer mm-hmm. and – he ended up working on the show as a as a producer and you know behind the scenes and he's like Matty, why don't you come and we'll make this come true and at first i thought we were going to like fake the whole thing i'm like dude there's no way how, how do you want me to learn how to play the piano he's uh-huh. like i will teach you we will recompose whatever songs that you want to play mm-hmm. so that you can play them and so that's what we did we recompose the song so that i could uh keep uh, the sound of that song, but without, you know, I can only hit, you know, a pianist has 10 fingers. Uh, theoretically, they could hit 10 different keys at the same time, mm-hmm. but I can only hit two uh, keys at the same time. So we had to recompose the music uh, so that it maintains the same structure, but that it's 
uh, missing notes. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. I understand. And, yeah. uh, yeah. so yeah. that's, that's the approach that we're taking right now in the future, though, we are working on having it with uh repeating builds and a recorder. So I'll play a part of the song. It will be on a recorder and the audience knows about this. And then I press a button that part of the song replays. And then I play over it mm-hmm. to, you know, continue, uh, to continue the song. Okay. I got it. I, I understand. That's interesting. Now in your motivational speaking, when you talk about, uh, I guess just your life and that, how that, what, what, what is that about? I think it's all based on my kind of experiences of, that. of life because, uh, I, I, so I have different versions of talks that I give. And I think most of the people, everybody who speaks has different experiences to pull stuff, to pull from. Some people are CEOs. Some people are inventors. Some people have, you know, climbed Mount Everest. Uh, I have, you know, my story and my experiences. And depending on the group that I talk to, it's different. For example, I might give a talk for uh, school children and it could, you know, it could be about my life, but it's very much with a focus on bullying. Right. And then in that afternoon, the same day, I could give a talk for uh, business people or engineers and it will all be about, you know, manipulation. And I'll, I'll be talking about sleight of hand, demonstrating certain sleight of hand and talking about economy of motion and how how I try to do this with the least amount of movement, mm-hmm. with the least amount of moves and how we can uh how we can use those principles in in the work that they do interesting whether it's you know building cars and you know is some of these car companies for instance depending on how their plant is built any step that they any step that goes into making the car will add a significant cost to mm-hmm. their production and so a lot of it is about you know mani- uh reducing reducing moves that need to be made removing uh machinery and and all all these things and doing things as as uh direct as you can i see talk about bullying earlier i when you were younger uh and growing up you're speaking i'm assuming from just some personal experiences were you bullied uh, mercilessly as a kid uh yeah i was i was bullied and uh it turned me into a bully as well did it okay. it did and, uh, you know, I, it's, uh, it's, it's too long to talk about in this, yeah, but yeah. It, you know, when you are, I think it'd be painful to kind of think back about some of the things that people calling you or freak or whatever, Yeah, just all stuff. sorts of names oh, and, and oh, beating goodness. you up. Sure. And, you know, I, I've, I've been Golly. stolen from people just taking, take advantage, of me, taking advantage of you, taking whatever you have Gee. right out of your pockets and, wow. you know, uh, being beaten up and, uh, and those experiences and what it does to you and how you react, especially at a young age. And the way I reacted was, you know, not well. I didn't want this to happen to, to me. And how what happens when you don't want something to happen to you? You, you make it stop. But then you, you, it's very easy to go beyond that and to and, – uh, You have to adapt and you kind of take on the people physically, yeah. I guess, too. There's not there. There's um, I think I think it's very easy for somebody who's angry to go beyond defending themselves to wanting to hurt somebody. Hmm. If that makes sense, yeah, it does. Hmm. Especially anybody who's been abused or anybody who's been hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of emotions, and that can that can bring you to very dark places in your life. I'm sure that people had told you, I think I heard you say yesterday about how that you had been told there are certain things like the piano that you can't do. And you just had the attitude is I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's almost a, it's almost a curse in a way because sometimes they tell you that you can't do something and you don't even want to do it. But then because they say <laughs> it, you're like, Oh, now I have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you drive a car? Uh, I don't drive a car. I just, yeah. and the reason is I just, uh, it's, it's just, it's more, it's, it's less money for me to just hire somebody mm-hmm. a, and to, to go on a trip with somebody and they sure. drive and they help me behind the scenes and me mm-hmm. modify a car and, and to, to modify a car is ridiculously expensive. It's yeah. in the tens of thousands of dollars. And once you have that installed in one car, 
that car eventually ages if it gets damaged. And you got to get another one then too. Yeah. Well, you mean you're in, in good company. David Copperfield doesn't drive himself either. Well, <laughs> well, there's a not much difference in between me and David Copperfield. <laughs> uh, so, um, what is your what would be your favorite card trick? I mean, when I first saw you perform, I think you were doing oil and water, and you still are doing that. You know, yeah. To, but uh, my favorite card trick. You know, uh, it, it depends. I, I really – one of the things that I've learned in Magic is that you never really know what's going to work. I, when you perform Magic a lot, you can you can tell that you can do the exact same thing in the exact same way and have two totally different uh, results in terms of the feedback of the audience mm -hmm. and how they accept it and if, you know, if the Magic is strong or if it's weak. And – one of the things that I'm almost obsessed with is trying to make it uh, personal to people. And so when you when you do come see my show, I've I've gotten in the comments uh, a lot of times from people who have come to see my show that even though I'm performing the same material, it's like a totally different show oh. because of the audience members that are the dynamics. Or different up on stage I, I i it's not only enough i think one of the goals in magic is for the audience to get to know you but i think you also have to get to know the audience and you have such a rich person with their own rich character and there's just so much about their personality and many people just use the the spectators as props whereas you can you know you can bring out their character on stage and it can make so much uh, so much more out of your show just because right. it's real. And it can be funny. It can be sad. It can be, uh, you know, serious. It, it, but so that's – and that also affects the way that I do magic because I also look at, you know, who's in the audience and what is going to be good with them. You know? Yeah, like I guess watching you today, you know, the uh, doing some close up, and that you were saying, you know, pick a number uh, between one and fifty-two. Oh, well, a lower number. You know, it could be a lower number. Or, yeah. You know, and you kind of play with them, you know, and the way that the audience were just eating it up, you know, that uh, yeah, really so had the that, audience that's, palm of your hand. That's a you know, that's an ambitious card routine, and uh, that that's a trick that I've been doing for a while, but it it changed in the last few years. I've been doing it. I just came up with this presentation where I just wanted to say as little as possible. In, in the show that you saw, I probably saw, said more than I usually say. Mm -hmm. But the concept is that I'm only saying or less. Yeah. So no matter what number they say, I just say or less or less. And uh, one of my friends, Shudagawa, when he came to see my show and I was doing that, he said it reminded him of uh, the scene in Goodwill Hunting. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where Robin Williams' character is talking to uh, Matt Damon's character, and he's this therapist. And Matt Damon has been abused by his father when he was a kid. Like his father was uh, just abusive and physically physically yeah. abusive. And so uh, Robin Williams' character says, "It's not your fault." And the guy's like, "Okay, yeah, it's not my fault." Like he's just yeah, like brushing it off. Like, yeah. And then Robin Williams says again. It's not your fault. And then the guy starts to laugh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I, I get it. It's not my fault. It, and then Robin Williams it repeats, it's yeah. not your fault. And the guy's laughing again. and But you can see he's laughing, but it's becoming, it's starting to sink in, yeah. pierce through. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not your fault. And he keeps saying it. And, and Matt Damon's character, you have such a wide range of emotions from first saying, okay, it's not my fault to laughing. Then it starts to get serious and then angry. And then finally he keeps saying it and keeps saying it until there's a release. And then Matt Damon starts crying. And, you know, if he finally accepts mm -hmm. uh, that. And I just thought what a what a beautiful thing to do something similar in magic where people know the conditions and you you just keep saying the same thing. And they have a wide range of emotions without you really doing much. You're just saying two words mm -hmm. and they go from confused. Okay. Accepting. Okay. Yeah. I could be off by, you know, a, a few cards Yeah, and then getting confused. Like, yeah, but it's, it's not that much. It's not that far off. And then laughing and being like, okay, there's something going on here. And then figuring out what's happening and, 
having having a cognitive thing where d- they know what the situation is, but then there there's a thought process where they're experiencing the magic within them and having all this inner emotion mm-hmm. and conflict, but you're going to that place where they finally accept it uh, with only saying you know a few words re- repetitively. Right. So, anyways, it's it's a. <laughs> Uh, and ever since I started doing it like that, I, I found it's been quite interesting, just uh, the interaction, because it, it also tells you so much about that spectator as well. So sure. much of them comes out and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it really pushes the line of being somebody being uncomfortable as well. Well, magic is a lot of magic is improvisational and you have to be able to go with what the audience's direction and they're leading you and you have to kind of go with it, uh, certainly. And I think that uh, the, it engages the audience with you more because they know that you're not just scripted. It, it does. And I think it makes things, it magnifies things because it's real, especially humor. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I don't do in my magic is I, I don't have pre, like I don't have jokes. I, like there's no jokes in what I do. I have a few lines that have successfully gotten laughs, but and I sometimes say them depending on the audience. Mm-hmm. But I I really try not to structure in uh, jokes because I find that humor is so much better when it's uh, situational, and you mm-hmm. can set up mag- uh, uh, situations that way. If you read the Jim Steinmeier book on Howard Thurston, he talks a lot about how Thurston didn't really have jokes in his show. But it was a very funny show because of what was happening on stage. The magician asking something, you hold this. And then like all these things happening and miscommunicate, Uh like uh, deliberate miscommunication and just different stuff going on that makes things funny. Hmm, Interesting. Like uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, David Blaine, uh, David Blaine was doing his show in Toronto. I went to go see it. And he he does this trick where he sews up his lips with a needle and a thread. Wow. Okay. And uh, anyways, it ends up there's a card inside his mouth, and there's a lady there, in the show that I saw. There was a lady who was brought up on stage, just a totally random lady, and he asked her, "Here's you know, here's the scissors. You're gonna cut. You're gonna cut the thread String now." String the thread. E. And. <laughs> so and it was really funny because she wore glasses. She had glasses around her neck. So she took off the glasses, she put the glasses on, and in that act of her putting on those glasses, yeah. the whole audience just started dying of laughing because they saw they saw David Blaine was like a little bit nervous. Like, here's this woman who can barely see putting on her thick right. glasses, and now she's going to be, you know, bringing scissors to his mouth. It was a naturally funny thing, and um, it was just so much – it was just so much funnier than if you know if than if somebody just had a pre-recorded line in a way because it's real. It's, it's like real, a, exactly. It's real drama, and yeah. I find when drama is real in magic, it it can elevate it. Uh, and the same same thing with humor in a way. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, um, you were also talking about uh, Penn and Teller a little bit earlier that whenever you've gone on to fool them. Um, that must have been just a great feeling because there oh, are very yeah. few people who have actually fooled them. I, mean, I, I didn't think I was going to fool them. I, I never went on the show to fool them. Uh, it's kind of a – it's you know, I just went on because I wanted to show good magic to people. And, I, and I, you know, I was actually shocked that I fooled them. And uh, – but I think – I think it's the same way – the way uh, Penn Jillette phrases it is so funny. He's like, you're cheating. You're doing sleight of hand without heads. Like how can we – how can we say that what you're doing, you're not doing what you're doing because we don't – we can't explain how you're doing right. what you're doing. Uh, so that was very fun. Uh, they, they've been wanting me to come back onto the show and I haven't been back on yet because I feel like there's – unnecessary pressure on me that I fooled them the first time. And if I go again, I have to fool them the second time. And my, a lot of the material that I do, it's very deceptive, but magicians are very familiar with a lot of the underlying principles Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of my magic is very classical in a way. Right. Right. And 
you know, Mandrake is based on a few principles. So if I would go back, I would really want to fool them. Uh, but it's, I think it's quite difficult to fool them. So you got to find the right trick. I got to find the right trick. Mm -hmm. And I don't want it to be like a, I don't want it to feel like cheating. I don't want to do like some convoluted mathematical trick. Okay. Or some like, <laughs> you know, something in mentalism. And because there have been people who go on with the, with the idea of going on to full pen and teller. And because they go on with that idea, they're not doing the best magic that they could do. Mm -hmm. So, and for me, that's, that's not what I want to do. They go, with, they go for the wrong reasons, you're saying. I, yeah. I mean, I think it's hard because the show, the format of the show, there have been the, some of the best acts haven't fooled them. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, there's a, there's a weird feeling in that like some sometimes an act fools them. And it's not the best magic that this person could do, but they did it because they wanted to have that, you know, credential of, oh, I fooled Penn and Teller. Right, right. And it's... You know, I think it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so where does your trophy uh, reside? My trophy right now is in New York. It's on David Roth's desk at the Conjuring Arts Research Center. <laughs> that is where it is. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, hmm, interesting. And I think David Roth's trophy might be there as well. Um, so I tell you what, as we start to wrap up over here, that uh, I appreciate the time, boy, it's flown by here. I know, I know. <laughs> that uh, I want to name my oh, but speaking of podcasts, I was going to say name my podcast the Magic Word, but uh, you have a podcast, and also, yeah, my podcast is uh, is called the Cage Canary Podcast. It's on beforemagic dot com. That's a little website that I have. That's for magicians. I have a podcast there. I also write some articles from time to time mm -hmm. on different magicians and different things in magic. And uh, I have playing cards for sale there and, and, you know, different stuff that I do online. I, I teach magic online. Uh, and I have a few people who have signed up for that. And we do, we do live uh, instruction every, every month. And do Skype or something or what? Uh, we use we do we do it through Patreon right now. So we do uh, we do private uh, we we do private live streams. Okay. So it, when you're signed up, you you get access to those live streams. So you can ask questions. You can you can chat and, and be involved that way. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun. I have two. I I want to do more with it. It's just so hard to do. Uh, I have a book club every single month. Uh, I will read a magic book and then talk about it on the live stream. And the live stream lasts Interesting. anywhere from an hour to I think the longest one's been three hours and forty minutes. Oh, okay, and it's just we talk about the book. We'll we'll talk. Uh, you know, I'll read uh, the Max Molini book and we'll talk about the magic in it and about Molini. You say life. we? There are people who are yeah, phoning well, in or something. The then? people, the people who are part of it, they, they can either. Sometimes they do uh, they do video. Sometimes it's just uh, text. They're commenting and stuff while they're watching live. Yeah. Okay. And again, for people to find that, where can they go? Uh, BeforeMagic.com. BeforeMagic.com. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and so, as I started to say, as far as wrapping up the name of my podcast, it's called the Magic Word Podcast. And so I always like to end by asking my guests of what their magic word is. That is, you know, what's your philosophy of life? It doesn't have to be a word. It can be a phrase or a sentence or just in general, a slogan, something. When you wake up, what uh, what do you live by? What do you? Oh, man. What have, inspiration I can you give two, others? Uh. I have two favorite words. One is indefectible. Indefectible. Which, indefectible, which means that if something is perfect, it cannot fail. Uh, that's a word that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other word that I really like is unquestionable. I think it's something that is very uh, – it's something that I aspire to. I, I think that would be – You aspire to be what? unquestionable uh hmm. in that what you're doing is not questionable you're always on the authentic it's all yeah it's always on the up and up and it's always of a high high quality like mm -hmm. that's i think a very good word 
Two, okay. <laughs> two, two. Those are two different words I've not heard before. That, uh, that Unquestionable? No, 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 no. I mean, as far as oh. people giving as far as a magic oh. word or phrase, you know. Sometimes people say family or love or that, uh, uh, you know, I was talking to John Bannon recently and he was saying, move the ball forward. You know, every day I kind of move the ball forward. You know, it's a different kinds of uh, things. So, Well, another word that I would use, it's sort of cliche, but uh, it, I think it's cliche because people don't understand it. Uh, but you, if you go on my website for for motiv- motivational speaking, the first word that I have big on the website is inspire. Mm-hmm. And it has the definition of, of the word, which is the real definition. It means to breathe something in you, to take it inside you and make it part of you. And that's what inspiration is. It's a pro- it's, that's the process of breathing when you're breathing something in. Mm-hmm. It, and it's you, something from the outside coming into you and becoming a part of you. And for me, that's what inspiration is supposed to be about and what it is truly. It's not about making people feel good. It's about it's about giving somebody something that becomes a part of themselves. Wow. Okay. I like that. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, good. that's good. Well, great. Maddie, this has been just wonderful. I've enjoyed the time we've had to spend here together. This has just uh, been delightful. Thanks for your words. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. And so for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Maddie Gilbert. This is Scotty out. Well, thank you, Maddie. I appreciate you being my guest this week. It was just a lot of fun and very inspirational and really a, a joy to get to talk with you and to share your thoughts and words with the rest of the listeners. And uh, for you who have been listening, I hope that you've enjoyed that as well. And I also want to thank all of you listeners for tuning in throughout this past year. We've had just a spectacular year. We passed number 500 uh, episodes uh, earlier this year, which we featured uh, Uri Geller and then and also, we've had probably well over 70 episodes when you think about all the ones we've had from daily updates from the conventions. We have uh, increased our listenership throughout the world. Internationally, we have uh, people who are contacting me on a fairly regular basis. And I appreciate uh, you, you guys sending me your texts and emails, your private messages, posting things uh, on Facebook and for sharing. And in that regard, if you will also just go to our Facebook page and like it, that would be great. You can kind of get a follow what we're going to be doing. And as these things come up, uh, that's going to be the Magic Word Podcast on Facebook. Just check that out and like us, please. And, of course, then subscribe to our pod letter each week. As we start to uh, go into the new year, I'm going to continue to hopefully give more content and more prizes and just uh, a whole lot of great stories from wonderful magicians from all over the world as I start to travel again. This past year, I believe I attended eight conventions, uh, so you guys got the benefit of uh, traveling along with me, and I continually hear from you that you enjoy those podcasts, uh, perhaps even more than some of these when I feature just one person, so that way you kind of feel like that you're with me when I'm traveling to the conventions. Also, if you haven't done it then yet, please go to the website at themagicwordpodcast.com, particularly for this blog, because I've got a link where you can order your 2020 magic calendar. So just go there and click on that, and through Amazon as an affiliate, we get a couple of pennies for each of your purchases. So uh, you're going to need a calendar, kind of know what's going to be coming up next year, so you may as well order one through the website and help the Magic Word Podcast as you go. And so as we finish out this year, again, I want to thank all of you for listening throughout these uh, past many episodes, and I look forward to being with you again next year, and I wish you a happy new year and a prosperous one as well. And so until next year (laughs) and next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to inspire someone and give somebody something that becomes part of themselves. This is Scotty out.